Hey guys, welcome to Oasis Church and thanks for tuning in. My name is Pastor Brady and this is my wife Renita. We're so glad you joined us today. Our prayer is that your faith and your heart will be strengthened as you listen to the word. God bless you as you listen. Amen. All right. Good morning, everybody. Um, if you are visiting with us today, um, if you're a guest, uh, maybe you're new to the area, maybe uh, someone here invited you, uh, maybe you're a college student visiting uh, for the first time, maybe you're a young parent, uh, a young family that's just still getting used to the rhythms of school. Are you guys okay? You're surviving that, right? Um, that's been a little crazy, right? Well, we are excited, as Bob said, we are excited that you are here. We want you to feel welcome. Um, our church is a place um, that uh, you can grow, you can connect, you can build friendships, you can build relationships, and, um, and you can get into, you can have your relationship with Jesus cultivated and grow in and be used, okay? Um, it's a train that's moving. We're going somewhere, right, Derek? Come on. Uh, and we, but we need all the giftings of the body to jump in. We need everybody to be all in. And uh, one thing I really appreciate about the college age and young adult age is there's a vibrancy and there's an energy. Uh, they're, not, they're not sitting on the sidelines. They want to jump in. And I think that's, that's a way that they can infect all of us in a good way, right? Um, so uh, what we want you to know, we love you. I know we just started our Oasis Young Moms Ministry. If you're a new young mom that's here, I want you to, I hope you feel loved. We, we care about you. Uh, there is a place here for you. Uh, so if you, like, like Bob said, fill that out. Let us get connected with you. Um, how many of you guys like fall? You guys like the fall season? Anybody, right? All right, okay. Can you guys believe it's here? I feel like 2023 just started. I was like, it was January, like yesterday. What happened? Like, it's already fall, right? Although the, the later summer was getting a little bit intensely hot, right? But I love fall. I mean, I love, we, we love hunting, right? We love, um, uh, what else do we like about the fall? Football season, right? Come on, football season, guys. Anybody? All right. Ladies, football season? Okay. Wasn't expecting that. That's great. Um, how about pumpkin spice everything, right? Pumpkin spice everything, but nothing's better then my mama's pumpkin roll, let me tell you. Can I get a witness to anybody in my family who's had that, a little slice of that? That's, that's delicious. Um, but we're going to be starting a new series today, um, and we're going to jump in it for the next four weeks. Um, it's going to be called This is Church. Ta-da, it's on the screen. Um, so if you have a copy of God's Word, go ahead and open it up and turn to Hebrews chapter 10. A little joke uh, for those of you who are wondering where the Bible talks about um, coffee. Uh, Hebrews. Get it? Um, I'm a dad now. I can do it. Um, we've been in Matthew for months now, like without stopping. We've been going week to week to week. Y'all been blessed by our study of Matthew, right? Jesus not pulling any punches, just like, man, like it or love it. Here's the son of God telling us about life. Here's the t telling us about eternity. And, uh, but we're going to pause that, like I said, for, uh, for a little bit. We've got, we got a lot of new people, a lot of uh, new young families and individuals, a lot of new college students that are here. And, uh, and also, it's just good from time to time for us to just kind of circle the wagons, if you will, and remind ourselves of who we are. What is the church? What are we about? Right? You guys know you can never get beyond those fundamentals. Right? It's like basketball. You can't ever, uh, you can't ever move past the triple threat position. See it? You guys intimidate like that's like we we need to we can never move past those basics and so we want to we want to kind of come around that and remind ourselves so what i'm going to do is give me just a couple minutes i'm going to introduce the series and then we're going to focus in on our first point of the series um, right after that so okay the series first um what we're doing for the next four weeks is we're getting back to the basics of christian growth like what is what is the church? Um, it's one of those things where, like, I don't know how many years ago it was, where Starbucks all across America shut down. You guys remember that? And they did that because they felt like they were getting off mission. They were getting off focus, right? And they kind of, it's that same idea, right? They were like, okay, how can we make our coffee taste more burnt, right? So that was the, anybody, anybody think Starbucks coffee tastes burnt? Um, so you're like, that's my favorite in the whole world. Um, but it's, it's that spiritual idea, too, of, remember the church at Ephesus in Revelation? Remember what Jesus told them? He said, go back and do the things you did at first, right? You've left, you, you, you had a love that was vibrant and on point, but you, but you left it, right? And it's, it's, it's that principle in Isaiah where it says, look back to the rock from which you were hewn, right? That's, that's that idea, and that's kind of where we're at with the, for these next four weeks. We're going to pause and we're going to look back to the rock from which we were hewn. We're going we're gonna to think about the things that we were doing before 
and maybe we've gotten off track. Um, but maybe you're just feeling, maybe some of us today are just feeling spiritually stuck, and you're just kind of in a foggy season, you know, spiritually, and you, you're like, we want to grow spiritually. I think most of us do, right? I mean, I don't think you'd be here on a Sunday morning, right, unless your husband or wife dragged you or something, unless you had some kind of desire to grow, right? Some kind of desire to, and, and you know, and, and you honestly think to yourself, you know, I, I want to I grow. If you don't, if you think, man, I don't need to grow spiritually, I'm trying to think of a friendly way to say this. I mean, that's just, that's super prideful. Like, I don't know how it's to, to say that. Um, and you might need to grow more than anybody else in here, <laughs> right? Um, but to grow spiritually, guess what, guys? Guess what? The Bible has a plan for it. The Bible has a plan for us growing spiritually, and that's what we want to get into. So now the plan is not overly complex, okay? Though how many of you guys know we make things complex, right? We, make, we can make things Overly complex. We have, humans have a great way of doing that. But here's the deal. The path to Christian growth, it's not easy. But it's simple. It is simple. Um, simple doesn't mean, don't, don't, don't hear me saying it's easy, right? I don't Because that sounds belittling and patronizing. I, I don't mean it's easy, right? Um, but it isn't complicated. Um, we think about Christianity, sometimes we're like, man, there's all these denominations and all these versions of the Bible, and, and they go to the bookstore, and there's all these, all, you know, which, who's legit, who's a heretic, who's not? I mean, I don't know, like, what do I read? And, and so what we do is we just like, ah, it's too complicated, and so we let ourselves off the hook from growing spiritually. And we just think, well, it's too complicated, how will I ever get started? But y'all, it is not complicated For the last several years now, Oasis has been uh, investing in a biblical-informed strategy for growth here at the church. Uh, We take it seriously. Um, A lot of people would say, man, there's not a one-size-fits-all, Brady, okay? Like, um, there's not a spiritual growth pattern. There's not this formula for spiritual growth in the Bible, right? It's kind of to each his own, right? To which I have a very theological response. That's bull, right? That is absolutely Bull, that's false, right? There absolutely is a formula, and we're going to see that together. Now, listen, God's got to bring the increase, right? Right? I mean, God's got to to bring the growth. Uh, God, we go to him to prosper desire. That's his work in us. But when we want to grow, we should do it by his means, by the formula that he has laid out for us. And those means aren't complicated, right? It's like health. Right? I mean, like, uh, we, we're like, oh, it's so complex, so hard. What do I do? I mean, goodness, you look on Facebook, every, there's like a million plans for how to get healthy or whatever. But I was reading an article on bodybuilding recently by John Cena, right? Because I'm a 200 pound, like, muscular force up here. So you guys are like, that makes sense. I'm sarcastic. I'm being sarcastic. Um, so, uh, you know, but I was reading this article, and John Cena basically said, you guys know what to do. You know what to do, right? You, you eat right, you sleep a lot, and you drink tons of water. That's what John Cena said, right? But he says it's simple, right? It's not, but simple, come on somebody, it doesn't mean it's easy, right? Simple doesn't mean easy. Can I get a witness, right? 10 o'clock at night, your favorite show's on TV, what are you reaching for, right? Uh, There it is, right? Sorry. Um, Dave Ramsey's been on the radio for 30 years, right? He's had one message. It's not super complicated, right? Uh, Give, make a budget, live on less than you make, invest the rest, repeat. That's 30 years that cat's been making a load, right, just like with a simple formula, right? Uh, now, that doesn't mean, though, that it's easy, right? But it, is, but it is simple. In the scriptures, we have a tried and tested formula from the early church. Um, it's an awesome picture that they give us where they gathered well, they grouped well, they gave well, and they went well. Gathered, grouped, give and go. That's our four weeks, right? Is that simple? They're all, they're all G. They are all G. Um, yeah. Uh, so uh, gather, grouped, give, and go. Um, and thank you for the picture. Uh, I hit Travis up uh, about 10 minutes ago, and he put that together for me. Thank you, buddy. Um, from Acts 2. So here, so here it is. Can I break it off for you? Uh, this is going to, I'm sorry, guys. I'm like, I have an obstacle, so I'm just going to have to just look at you from over here. Uh, listen to this. Day by day, Attending the temple together. What's that? Gather. Breaking bread in their homes. Group. They receive their food with glad and what? Generous hearts. Give. See, the early church, it's not all right here, but you see the seedlings of it, right? So they're they're so generous, right? And then he says, and praising God, having favor with all the people, the Lord added to their number 
as, as, as they were doing what? The Lord added to their number as, what, as they were telling people what God was doing in their lives. As they were sharing about God. They, he added to their number, day by day, those who were being saved. This is the formula. Do you guys see it? And this is what we've invested in as, as elders, where we're going. And we just want to, for the next four weeks, just kind of unpack that for all of us. All of us get on the same page for where we're going. If you want to grow in the Christian life, man, jump all the way in the stream. Jump all the way in the stream. I'm going to make a super bold claim. Ready? This is pretty bold. All right, I never do this kind of thing. If you get in the stream of Christian growth, you will move with the current. If you get in the stream of Christian growth, you will move with the current. I mean, I've seen that over and over again now. Three and a half years as lead pastor, six or seven years before that as associate pastor, years as a youth pastor, a college pastor, a worship pastor. I've seen this over and over and over, right? It's, it's a bold statement, but I don't know that I've met one person in my whole life personally, just me. I don't think I've ever want, met one person in my whole life who wasn't growing spiritually when they were invested fully, fully in all four of those. Anybody else? Now, now God's got to do it, right? God's got to bring the increase. But I'm telling you, we do it through his means. And these are his means. And so, again, it's, I'm not saying it's, uh, it's I don't want to make it sound overly simple, right? Um, I've done, but I've done a lot of counseling and I've sat across the table from a lot of people, and usually if there's stagnation and there's no spiritual growth, I can usually diagnose it with one of, those four, with one of these four questions. What's your commitment like to the gathering? Do you have Christian community in your life? Are you willing to give of your time, talent, and treasure, right? And I ain't talking about throwing God a tip here and there. I'm talking about tithing. I'm talking about investing. I'm saying, is your wallet connected to the mission of God? right? Does he have that too? Are you going? I mean, uh, are you actually, you know, willing to share, willing to invest with the church on big days, outreaches, uh, you know, whatever it is where these missional things were, are you in? Like, are you all the way in? Um, Man, for so many people, I think Christianity is like the guy who goes to the pool party and, and doesn't get wet, right? There's a word for that guy, boring, Right? I mean, they're just like hanging out on the outskirts, kind of like on the edge, you know, not wanting to kind of go all the way in. And so many people, that's kind of the Christianity that they live. And it's, it's like, no, man, Christianity is one of those things where you, you jump in. You get all the way in, and then the current will take you to maturity. So for the next four weeks, we're going to talk about gather, groups, give, and go. It's super simple. So let's focus in on gather, right? I'm going to kind of give a, a bird's eye view, and then we're going to come back and focus in deeply on the first one. So this is from Hebrews 10, 19 through 25, and it gives us one of the greatest pictures, guys. It gives us a rock. It gives us a pillar and a buttress. It's essential to Christian growth, and it's not neglecting meeting together. In Hebrews 10, there were groups of people. And this is true from the very beginning, okay? We think, oh, we live in this world now where everybody's commitment to church is kind of nominal. People are putting all these things. Guys, this was 2,000 years ago, right? The very beginning of the church. And what he's saying is, man, don't neglect meeting together. If you start neglecting meeting together, you'll start neglecting other things, okay? And we'll talk about this later, but I can also attest to this in my Christian walk. Anybody who's been a Christian for any length of time can attest to this as well. The first step to walking away from the faith is walking away from the flock. It's just true. It's just this idea that I don't need people. I don't need to meet. Uh, I can just meet Jesus with my latte, my burnt coffee at Starbucks, or go on a nature walk. And uh, and what the Bible's trying to get at today that we're going to see is, no, you actually need to meet. You need to gather. Um, The big idea is that gathering with believers isn't peripheral. It's not extra credit. It's not bonus. It's absolute essential. Absolutely essential. That means you don't grow past it. That means you don't like get your PhD in 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 loving God and then you can just like you know go to to heck with his formula. Like you don't you don't move beyond it. You can't build beyond it. It's a fundamental part of it. And so, and, and guys, listen, I, I know there's a balance here, right? So, I mean, I know that there's situations where people are bedridden and people are sick. I don't want anyone to feel any condemnation. I posted something on Facebook, I don't know, two or three weeks ago. And, um, 
it was just about this essentialness of the church, right? And somebody put on there like, well, what about people that are sick? What about... Okay, I mean, obviously, right? I mean, if people are sick, people are, uh, things happen, right? I mean, so, but I'm saying the normative description that the Bible gives us is that it's essential. It's not peripheral. It's not extra credit, right? And so, um, but I, and, and, and here's what I wanna do. And some of you guys I've had conversations with and you're kind of helping, you're thinking through this with me, right? I wanna press back on our Western American ideas of this, right? I mean, we come with glasses on. Right, And I want to press back on it as we look at God's word, kind of like Francis Chan's whole deal. If you're on a deserted island, you got a copy of God's word. Would it really look exactly how it looks? And so I'm like, let's take it from this. Like, and I want to kind of press back a little bit on our ideas of church and see what, 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 what and compare that with what do we see in God's word. So what I want to do is I want to hold up today the beauty of, of what God does in the assembly of the church gathered together. Not a building, right? We could be out here under a, under a bush. And yes, Bob, we would have more mosquitoes. Uh, so that's why we're in here. Praise the Lord with air conditioning, right? But like, what does God do? And I want to uphold the, the beauty of that. And, uh, and, so, and, and, and listen, um, what we've got to do is... If we have a different view, and actually COVID pressed on this quite a bit, right? This, it made a lot of elders and a lot of people think through, like, what, what, what are we doing on Sunday mornings? And what's the, right, it kind of pressed on a lot of that as people were like, yeah, we don't, we're not going to meet for six months. We're not going to meet for a year. It made, a, a lot of elders had to really dig down and, okay, wow, what, 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 where should our convictions lie here, right? Um, and, 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 and so, if, but here's the deal. If our view of church and gathering together is fundamentally different than what we see here the Bible's not wrong. Like, I mean, you, you might have an issue. You, you might need to change how you think, right? I mean, because that's what we do, right? We don't, we, don't, we don't make the Bible conform like Thomas Jefferson did and go tear out pages and, and circle certain things, right? That's not how we approach God's word, right? We, we conform our mind and our hearts to the word of God. And so uh, that's what we're going to look at today. So uh, we're going to be looking at Hebrews 10, 19 through 25. And, um, and I'm going to build out the, our first point, and then we're going to look at a little bit of application together and just kind of walk through this tech together. Is that, is that okay with you guys? So, um, so open, up your, open up, if you haven't already turned there, Hebrews, um, here we go, chapter 10, starting in verse 19. Um, I'm going to hop around a little bit. Is that okay? Can I do a little ADD thing? Um, so m look down to verse 22. Let us draw near with a true heart. Now, there's going to be three imperatives, note takers, three imperatives, okay? And the first one's right there. Let us draw near with a true heart in full assurance of faith with our hearts sprinkled clean from an evil conscience and our bodies washed with pure water. Now, that's an allusion to baptism, right? You get saved, says the word of God. You get baptized, right? It's that simple. That's how it works. We're gonna get baptized next Sunday. If you've never followed the Lord and believers' baptism, that's like your first baby step as a Christian. That's like the first thing the Lord says, let's go, identify with me publicly and let this be a picture to the world, the nations, the church of what I've done in your, reality, in your life, right? And we're gonna have a party Right, we're gonna have a little jam sesh, Deanna, right after it's done. Right, I'm gonna let you come up and hit the electric, and it's gonna. We're gonna have streamers, right? Gail, where are you at? You're gonna be doing our streamers on this side, Nedra on this side. Um, it'd be awesome if you actually did bring them. That'd be great. Um, right, so we're gonna. So, uh, but let me move on. I'm getting distracted. Okay, so let us hold fast the confession of our hope. What? Without wavering. Now that's the second imperative. Remember, I'm doing the flyover. We're gonna come back and dig down. Without wavering. So draw near. Let us hold on to, hold on to it without wavering, because why? Because he who promised is faithful. And here's the third one. Let us consider how to stir up one another to love and good work. So draw near, hold fast, and consider how to stir up each other towards love and good works, not neglecting to meet together as is the habit of some. So, hey guys, like non-attendance and people having a spotty commitment to being a part of the church, that's not new. That's not like new to the West or new to America. This is 2,000 years ago, and it's from the very beginning of the, of the church. What happens? People drift. We drift, right? My brother has this thing. He has stickers, and he's probably going to get a tattoo at some point, right? Sorry, Mom. I know you don't want crazy about those, but he's probably going to get a tattoo somewhere. It says, fight the drift. It's like his thing. Like, in all areas of life, fight the drift, physically, mentally, emotionally, maritally. Fight the drift, right? And uh, we sort of have a spiritual block as Americans Right? Can I just point out our goggles? Can I point out our glasses? Right? When I say this, you're going to feel something. 
okay? And that's it, all right? You ready? We have this mental block where we don't like that we need people. We don't like that we need people, right? We, um, we have a spiritual block towards anything that says you need other people in your life. Pfft, I'm an old man, yo. I don't, you know, that's kind of, right? So that's the way, and we got we to gotta fight that together. He says, not neglecting to meet together as is the habit of some, but encouraging one another, and all the more as you see the day approaching. Right there, it's talking about um, the day of judgment, all right? So every Christian lives with two dates on their calendar, this day and that day, and that day informs how we live this day, right? So that's kind of what he's talking about. Okay, so I pointed them out, now let's jump in. Number one, draw near. Look at verse 22. Look at verse 22. Let me read the whole thing. Let us draw near with a true heart in full assurance of faith, with our hearts sprinkled clean from an evil conscience and our bodies washed with pure water. This idea of drawing near through the blood of Christ is full of temple imagery, right? Sacrifice imagery, priest imagery. And it's showing us that what Jesus has done is superior to the, to the old sacrificial system, right? He has brought salvation, it's the gospel, right? Verse 19. Okay, let's hop back up here. Therefore, therefore what? Whenever you see a therefore, you should say, what's the therefore, therefore? The therefore is therefore because he just talked about in chapter 10 earlier, uh, the Christ sacrifice once for all. So therefore, because of Christ's sacrifice, brothers and sisters, that means brothers and sisters, since we have confidence to enter the holy places by the blood of Jesus, by this new and living way, okay? I'm, I'm gonna break it up, okay? So um, verse 19 says, having confidence to enter into the holy place. And an easy way to say this is if you look back at Israel's history, right? If you look back at their history, you got one priest who went into the temple one time a year to make atonement for the people, right? And now he's saying this about what Jesus has done. Y'all, what was reserved for one place what was, what was reserved for one person once a year is now available because of what Jesus did to all of us. It's available to all of us. We can enter into a relationship with God. Wow. We can have a deep, meaningful communing with God. And we get there because we have a better high priest. We have a better sacrifice Right, We have a better high priest. His name is Jesus Christ, Yeshua. What Jesus has done is he's given us greater access to God. Great, incredible access. Something world game-changing happened when Jesus Christ came. And that is that his sacrifice on the cross covered our sin. We could never have come into the holiest of places before that. Right? I mean, Felicity was getting some of this stuff last night. Right? She was just like, why do we pray in Jesus' name? Like, do we talk to God? I'm just like, girl, you're three. Lay off. Right? Come on. Right? So, you know, um, it'd be like if we came into the holiest place that stood before God, right, without the covering and the sacrifice of Jesus. Right? I remember one pastor said, he said, you, don't, you, you might not have to say in Jesus' name when you pray. And he's an intense guy, right? But he says, but you better think it. I was like, Whoa. Right, Because he says, that's the only way you can talk to the Father. It's in Jesus' name. It's no small thing to talk to God. Right, if, To be in his presence without the covering of the sacrifice and the blood of Christ is to be a piece of tissue paper on the surface of the sun. He's holy. He's righteous. Angels are in his presence all the time, millennia after millennia covering their faces and covering their feet and crying, holy, holy, holy is the Lord God Almighty who was and is and is to come. Holy, 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 holy. And they do it again and again and again. But we're sinful. We're dirty. And that's why Jesus sacrificed himself. He went and stood, friend, in our place we deserved what was coming to us we deserved the wrath of god 
for our anger and our unforgiveness and our lust and our gossip and our resentment and our entitlement and our pride. We deserved to be that tissue paper on the surface of the sun in front of a holy God. We deserve for it to bear down on us, but Jesus took it for us. And he covers us in his blood. Now look, I know some of you who might be new to the faith or visiting today, you're like, whoa, this dude's intense, right? First of all, I'm holding back, okay? (laughs) Um, Secondly, and those who know me know it's true. I have balance issues, all right? But so do you, Matt. So, you know, I know that some of you might be new, and it might seem like really graphic imagery, but guys, it's through the whole Bible, right? And if you don't don't understand what Christ did, you hear us singing about the blood, and it sounds twisted, and it sounds sick. We're talking about the blood of Christ, and these people are smiling and clapping. What the mess is going on with these psycho people, right? I mean, that's what you would, that's what you would think, right? But this is the imagery through all of the Bible. It's his sacrifice that covers all our transgressions and sins. His blood washes over us, right? We need to do that song again, Brandon, that song. He has washed us with his blood. He has washed us, right? Or what about that old school when we do bluegrass style a lot of times, right? There's wonder work and power, what? In the blood, right? That's covered us. We deserved that. We deserved hell. And he covered us in his blood. We deserved the cross. We deserved the wrath of God. Why? For our sin, Man, for our idolatry, our putting other things before him, for our anger, our pride, our sexual sin, our neglect of the poor, our lust, our gluttony, our gossip, et cetera, et cetera. You name it, we've done it, and we deserved what he got. We deserved what Jesus got, but he stood in our place. Dang. You can say it in brief. The gospel is this. Jesus in my place. Maybe we should make a bumper sticker that says that, right? Jesus in my place. And because Jesus stood in our place, now we have access to the Father. Somebody say, wow. Like we have access to the Father. If now we have access because of a relationship through Jesus Christ. Okay, so the imagery there, keep, let's keep moving. Look at, look at this. He says the curtain, okay? Do you guys see where he goes down into that? He says, he says um, by the new and living way that he opened for us through the curtain. And then praise God for him like breaking it down for us. That is through his flesh. Now let me explain. That imagery is from Matthew 27. Okay, when Jesus died, a lot of things happened. One thing that happened was when Jesus died on the cross, the curtain, a veil that separated the holiest place from everybody else was torn. When Jesus died, the Bible says that it was torn from top to bottom. Isn't it beautiful that it was from top to bottom? I mean, it's like, it's the Father, right? It's like, I mean, how would you rip it? I mean, these, this curtain, we don't have time to go into it, but it was a thick curtain. How thick was it, Glenn? About four feet thick, okay? So, you know, you aren't going down there, right, um, Mr. Cena, and ripping that thing in half, right? You're just, I don't care who you are, all right? Arnold Schwarzenegger in his prime couldn't do that, right? And from top to bottom, Right? They didn't have uh, lifts during that time, right? So, I mean, what's the, what's the imagery of that, though? The imagery is something that Jesus has done, has given us access where we don't have to be shut off from Christ anymore, right? I mean, this is, this is where our Catholic friends get it wrong, right? We don't have to go through a priest. That's why Jesus came. That's why Jesus came. I don't confess my sins to a man, right? I confess my sins to the Father through the Son, right? That's the whole reason he came, Right? Look what it says. It says in Hebrews 10, 20. Man, look at this. It says, by the new and living way, he's opened for us the curtain. That is through his flesh. The imagery is so straightforward, right? Jesus died on the cross so that we can come through him. Faith in him, right? We go through him and we end up coming alive again spiritually. We have a relationship. This is the beauty of the gospel, right? Jesus went in our place. We just recently had the anniversary for 9-11. Um, and uh, man, there's so many heroic stories that came, that came out of the tragedy of 9-11, and one of them surfaced months after the actual event had taken place, and it was known as the man with the red bandana. Anybody heard of this story? Um, Wells Crother was a young stock trader. Uh, he was in the South Tower at 9.03 a.m. United Airlines, flight 175, bam, hits the tower. He's there. This is a guy who was a volunteer firefighter. He played lacrosse. Um, he played football. And man, 
when the tower got hit, he immediately sprang into action, right? The first thing that people remember about him is literally carrying a woman who was severely burned on his back down many, many, many flights of stairs, yelling at other folks on the way, follow me, follow me, don't go that way, follow me. It goes all the way down, all the way down to the bottom and, and, and hands her off to some, to some EMTs and goes all the way back up. And he goes all the way back up and he gets more people, right? While everybody else is running to safety, dude goes back up in the building. What else did he do? He immediately found, what he did is before he went up the second time, this is what people say, he tied the red bandana around his mouth so that he could could help him breathe. And he turned around and went up. That red bandana was later found out uh, he had had since he was six years old. How many of you guys' dads used to wrap a comb in a bandana and put it in your pocket? That's what it was from. His dad would take a comb, wrap it in a bandana, and he'd hand it to him, and he'd had it since he was six. And he was kind of known. This was a theme for him, right? He, people knew uh, he played football. He had it stuck in his football pads, right? He put it in his lacrosse pads. He kept it with him all the time, right? And he had that red bandana that day, and he went back up those stairs, and, and, and he went all the way back up and puts more people on his back, and they come and follow him out. He goes back down this time, falls in line with a group of firefighters, um, and goes back in. The only difference is they got gear. He ain't got any. Goes back up again. The tower fell at 9.59 a.m., and they found Wells Kroger, Crother's body with a bunch of firefighters months later when they were able to untangle, untangle the rubble. Later, it became apparent through testimony, that he had, he had saved around 18 people that day. And you know what was said about him? The man with the red bandana was going up so that other people could come down. Jesus Christ went up on a cross so that you could come down off it. Jesus went up and through the forgiveness and the presence of God in our lives, he did that so that you could come down. He did that so that you could be free. That's the gospel. It's Jesus. And they're about to drive the spikes through your hand and the spear in your side. And they're about to crucify you. And he pulls you off the cross. And he gets up there. And he's mutilated in your place. He went up so that we could come down. So draw near to him. Okay, my question for us is in light of his sacrifice, as we, as we think about that, are you drifting or are you drawing? Are you drifting Or are you drawing? Are you drifting away today? Man, Brady, I've just been kind of stuck spiritually in light of that sacrifice. Would we draw near to him? For some, that means drawing near to him for the first time. For some of us, it means that at at some point after this service or when you get home, you're going to hit somebody up and and the Lord is speaking to you right now and you know you need to take that step. It's long enough. You've You've let stupid stuff hold you back and it's time for you to accept his sacrifice for your sin and to not go about life wondering about your eternal destiny, right? For some of you, it might be kind of waking up, right? Rousing yourself, remembering, man, Jesus has done incredible things for me. He loves me and I wanna draw near to him. I want to be more resolute. All right, keep moving with me. Verse 23, let us hold fast the confession of our hope without wavering for he who promised is faithful. What does hold fast mean? It means grab onto and don't let go, right? Um, think of an illustration here of a time in your life where you had to hold on to something, right? Maybe it was a, you captured a snake and it was in a bag and you had to hold on to that mug. You didn't want to drop it, right? I remember my brother was on a, a racing jet ski and this was one of the greatest joys of my life to watch this. And uh, anyway, he, he, he started to fall off of it and when he fell, he throttled fully. And I watched him skip across the lake, holding on and, and bouncing up and down like on the back of it. It was just hilarious. Do I sound twisted? Is that wrong? Sorry. Um, <laughs> You know, or it could be when I went mountain climbing and I wanted to be a tough guy and do it with no anti-nausea medicine. And I was paralyzed and I tried to vomit for an hour and a half, but couldn't. I couldn't get any relief. They had to tie a rope around me to keep me from falling off the mountain. And, uh, and I was holding on to it, right? It's that kind of holding on. You hold on no matter what and you do not let go, right? That's that holding fast. So what does holding fast mean? It might mean even if it's scary, even if it hurts, you don't let go. You know, but what does that look like? What what exactly are we supposed to hold on to like a pit bull or a bulldog, right? Our confession of our hope, the gospel, 
right? And what he's saying is the gospel is God in love sent Jesus, which means he will come back for us one day. And he's saying, don't let that go. Hold on to that without wavering. Some of you high school students are under immense pressure, and that pressure is growing to just, to just join the party of what people are doing and to throw aside any kind of conviction of what you've been taught by your parents or in church. Hold on. Don't let go. Some of you girls are being pushed and pressured through Facebook and social media. you got to look a certain way, and you got to act a certain way, and you got to be shady, and you got to show more skin to be accepted. Hold on. Hold on to the truth. Don't, don't, don't conform to that, right? Some of us, some of us are, are feeling pressure as parents, right, the, to judge our kids based on academics or based on athletics. Don't do that. Hold on. Be more concerned with their spiritual state. Be more concerned with things that are important. How are they doing spiritually, right? And, and, and so we could go on about these. Some of, some of you are being tempted today to let go of a marriage. Don't. Hold on. Hold on, right? And some of you, maybe it's a moral decision, right? The money's not worth it. Hold on to what you know is right. Hold on to the gospel. This is a charge for us. And he says, don't waver. Don't flinch, right? And here's the application. Are you wavering? Could your life be characterized as wavering? Or could it be characterized as just being blown in the wind, right? I mean, man, I've been there. We've all, if we're honest, right? Can we be honest, right? I mean, we've all been there, right? Kind of just sorting, sort of fighting adrift or drifting along, right? We think about missions, and we're all excited, and the next thing we do, what? We're just living for our mission, our next mission, right? We're thinking about what we want to buy, what we want to do, what we want in our lives, or our own lives, and I think this is here for us to, it's a charge for us to hold fast, and then look what we look at next. Then we we'll look at it, it says, for he who promised is faithful. So how do you hold fast? You hold fast by remembering. You hold fast by remembering. Remembering what? Remembering that you ain't holding fast to nothing that ain't already got a grip on you. Right? Right? That's why I, 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 even in high school, I changed the words, Jesus, lover of my soul, Jesus, I will. And even as like a 15-year-old, it's like, those words aren't right. Jesus will never let us go. If it was on me, right? That's why we sing that song, he will hold me fast. Anybody else thankful that our, our salvation, our relationship with God is not dependent on how white-knuckled your grip is? Man, come on, high-five somebody for a minute. That's something to celebrate, guys. Come on. Hey, some of you guys didn't do that. What's going on? All right? All right? He will hold us fast. We do it by remembering that he's got a tight grip grip on us. So if you're a believer, man, he's already holding the fast to you. And he's not going to let you go, right? Now we're getting gospel-centered now. If you're a believer, how do you grow? You don't grow by being afraid that he's going to let go of you. Some of you were raised that way. You were raised, you can lose your salvation. You, you, you sin, God's going to let go of you. And you live with this paralyzed fear. Right, I went through a season where I had that, not because of dad's preaching, just personally. And I asked the Lord to come to my heart like 30 times every night. I was just scared. I was like, come to my heart. Come to, do I have it? He's like, come to. I lived in fear, right? But no, we don't live, we don't grow by being afraid that God's going to let go of us. If you're a believer in Christ, it's not that. Actually, you want to grow. You want to, you want to hold on to God more and more. When you look at your sin and you realize God loves you and he couldn't love you more than he does right now if you're in Jesus Christ. There's nothing you can mess up. There's nothing you can do to make him let go of you, right? If you get some of that down in your tank, if you get some of that down in your soul and you remember that he's faithful to you and you remember that he has promised that he will never let you go, then, man, you're going to want to hold on to him with all your might. And so this third part, this is where we're going to land the plane, guys. We consider one another. It says, and let us consider how to stir one another to love, stir up one another to love and good works, not neglecting to meet together as is the habit of some, but encouraging one another all the more as you see the day drawing near. Okay, so drawing near, hold fat, right? Draw near, why? Because his blood is sufficient, Jake. Draw near and then hold fast, why? We remember he's holding us. We remember he's faithful and so we hold on to him and let us stir one another up. It's this idea that carries with it kind of irritation, right? Right. When I stir my kids up in the morning when it's time to go to school, like they're a little irritated, right? And they're just like, Daddy, get off me. And it's just like, you Genesis 3 kids, right? You little sinners, right? It's like, but um, what's it like when the body of Christ come together? 
right? We, there's preaching and there's singing and we talk to one another. We ask each other how we're doing, right? And it's a bit of an irritant. It's, a, it's stirring things up, right, toward the right thing. It's the idea of like a cattle prod, right? For you farmers, you're like, here's an analogy I can get with, right? Cattle prods, right? My kids talk to our cows. We don't have cows, but they think they're theirs uh, in, the, in the neighborhood. And they say good night to them and good morning and just, you know, and, uh, and Asen just wants to throw sticks at them, right? But it's this idea of a goad, right? Um, we, we don't like it, but it keeps us going in the right direction. Stirring is even similar to spur, right? So if you're a cowboy, right? Um, Teresa, you know, um, your little boy would love this analogy, right? The cowboy stuff. Like it's, it's, a, it's that analogy, right? You're not abusing them, but they don't like it. But what does it do? It keeps them going in the right direction, right? And if you're thinking about this, you're like, no, 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 don't think about it that way. Think about it this way, right? And what the Bible's saying is when we come together, we have the opportunity to stir one another up so that we would what? So that we would persevere in the Christian faith. And in that context, he says, if you don't want to lose your faith, if you want to draw near, if you want to hold fast, if you want to encourage each other, You'd better do it in community. I mean, look at the context here, guys. He's going through, he's okay. He just went through in the chapter, Christ sacrifice once for all. This is weighty stuff. He's talking about the blood of Christ. And now we have confidence to enter in by the blood of Jesus, right? This curtain, this Old Testament veil has been torn, right? Draw near, hold fast. Why? Because he's faithful. And then he says, and, and consider how to stir one another up. And look, he's giving these weighty theological. And where's the first thing that his mind goes to? After all of this that he's talked about, sacrifice of Jesus and and the blood of Christ, and now we can draw near to God, the first, what's the first obstacle he points to? Our passivity towards community. That's the first thing. Look at it. First thing. There's like glory, glory, hold fast, and he's faithful, and the blood of Christ, we can draw near. Don't neglect it. Some are in the habit of doing that. Don't neglect it. Do you see the glory of what's happening? I just, I think we have a very diminished view of what happens here. Like we have a very low view. Oh, I'm gonna go to church today, hear the preacher, gonna sing a few songs and have some coffee. And there's bigger things going on here. There's eternally significant things going on here. And just because you can't spell them out and write them in a Word document doesn't mean they're not happening, right? I mean, I mean isn't, men, isn't that why we go on dates with our wives? Right? Well, we went to dinner, had a burger. What's it doing? It's building relationship. It's doing a hundred things. You're opening up the opportunity for greater intimacy. You're opening up the opportunity to be a safe place. You're opening all kinds of stuff is happening on a date night. Well, this is so much more. I mean, as the Spirit of God in me and in you testifies together, the Lord is doing very eternally significant things as we come together. Right? And He says, if you don't want to lose your faith, you don't want to step away from God. If, if, if you want to hold fast and live a life encouraged and, and, and being an encourager, you do it in community. You do it in community, not forsaking the assembling of yourselves together. That word assembling is actually a carryover from an Old Testament word, synagogue. And it's a, so it's a carryover word he's using. And he's actually saying, just like we're meeting together now, we're kind of doing right now. We meet together and we assemble for the express purpose of worship and stirring one another up. Look at it. Not neglecting to meet together. Now, let me get serious for just a minute. If we want to draw near, if you want to hold fast to Christ, if you want to encourage each other like a spur, right, or as an iron sharpening iron, if we want to do these things, you absolutely cannot do them according to the word of God. You cannot do them in isolation. You can't do them in isolation. We cannot do that if we have decided that the church gathered like it has for 2,000 years in settings like this is optional for us. Gathering together is essential for Christian growth and perseverance, all right? It's, it's essential. Maybe think about it like this. When we gather together, it's like Transformers. You guys remember that commercial? More that meets the eye. Remember that? <laughs> There's more going on that meets, than meets the eye. There's something, there's something about drawing near to the Lord together. There's something about holding fast together. There's something about persevering that's happening. There's a spiritual glue that's happening when we gather together for the express purpose of worship and praise in these things. Can I ask you a question? Let me ask you a question. If this is true in your life at all, 
I want you to raise your hand, okay? I'm going to ask four or five questions. You ready? If God has worked mightily in your life in a church gathering situation, an assembly like this, now what I mean by that is you either you prayed to receive Christ in a gathering. Um, man, God seriously healed you of a sin issue or a physical issue. Um, there was a major breakthrough of a truth in your life that you needed. Um, you met somebody that ended up being very important, integral to your faith. Like, man, I'm where I am because of this guy or this girl. That's the thought. Now, if that's not you, you might be newer. And I hope that that shows you. I hope. So, so go ahead and raise your hand if that's true of you. Go ahead and look around for a minute. Now, listen, I hope that that shows you. If, if you're new and you're like, you're like, okay, I don't really have an opinion. I hope that gives you an appetite for what can happen, what God can do in these assemblies, what the Lord can do in these, in these gatherings. But my point is this. When you guys saw all the hands go up, it's crazy how we think over 2,000 years of this, even, even the beginning of the church, and we think we don't need the gathered body. Even though the evidence is, I mean, this is, you guys testified, not me, right? When the body gathers together, look what God does. And that's why, in part, he calls us to it. I mean, there's always been this persistent isolation temptation in the church of Jesus Christ. I mean, it goes all the way back. Look, it goes all the way to Hebrews chapter 10. There's always been this idea of, man, I get mature in my faith, and then I don't need anybody anymore, right? I'm learning, I'm growing, I can be individualistic. Me, Jesus, and, a, and some coffee at Panera Bread, man, that's all I need. I can listen to Francis Channel online. Right? He's better than Brady, like way better. Right? So, you know, I don't need anybody. I don't, I don't need anybody. I don't need the gather body, right? I watch this guy online. I watch this guy, uh, this person overseas, and I'm growing in my faith. This has been a temptation forever. And we begin to feel like we don't need it, like it's optional. And what God's word is trying to tell us, what God's word is trying to do, what I'm trying to do is to give a dire warning. And that is to say, guys, nobody should be that prideful. Nobody should think to themselves, I can't fall, I can't stumble, I can't let go, I can't walk away, I can't, my faith won't get diminished, I can't be deceived. And what we've got to realize today is there's something about the gathered assembly that continues to help us. Hebrews 10, draw near, hold fast, and encourage one another. Again, you could say it, I said this earlier, no one walks away from the faith without first walking away from the flock. You, you talk to any pastor that's not crazy I mean, like any pastor, and they'll tell you that's exactly true. When someone starts missing this, about 99, I mean, it, it, they're either sick or there's some kind of weird, maybe they got deployed to Afghanistan. I mean, it's, 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 it's one of these, uh, you know, things that, but 99% of the time, something ain't going right in their life. It's the first thing to go. It's the first thing to go. And nobody ends up way down the road in isolation and individualism and totally with a whacked out view of the kingdom and the body of Christ and what it means to pour into others and have people pour into you without having the thought first, the gathering is a non-essential. We'll go when we have time. Right? We'll, we'll go when the kids are doing okay. Uh, we'll go when the weather's not great for whatever, an outside, outside activity, right? We'll go when we don't feel like going on a nature walk. We'll go, uh, or, you know, or something else, right? Maybe I'm tired, or, or when our friends aren't in town, or when we don't have ball games or practice. Man, I, I could do a parenthesis right there. You know, why do they put so much of that stuff on Sundays? I can't tell you the number of kids that end up as adults wanting nothing to do with the church, and when they were coming to church, their families prioritized sports over faith. Sports over gathering together on Sundays. It's, just heart, it's heartbreaking. And it's heartbreaking as a pastor to see it because you see it coming. And, and, and it's like, I wish I wasn't right. But 100% of the time, that's what happens. Right? We don't, but dude, we're not gonna build this in on the front end of our schedule of the month. Right? We're gonna see if we have anything left over. Okay, let's get done what we need to get done. We got all this stuff going on and we're gonna see what we have left over and we'll give that to God. Right? We'll throw them the scraps. Right? Guys, these are some of the most dangerous first steps that people begin to make to make shipwreck of their faith. And you guys, look, I know it's tough, right? Just so you know, don't think I got a swagger up here. I, this is a hard sermon to preach. It's a hard sermon to hear. This presses on our American individualism. It presses on maybe 30, 40, 50 years of how we did church, how our parents did church, right? I know this is pressing on some stuff. This isn't a popular word, but this is the word of God, right? Right? 
I mean, and again, because, because of COVID, you know, it's like we had to think through a whole lot of this stuff. And I'll just say this about online kind of stuff. It's a blessing. Praise God for it when you're home and sick. But you cannot be the church online. You cannot be everything the church was meant to be in God's word on the internet. And so for us as at Oasis, it's, not, it's a non-issue. It's, a not a, it's not a debate. The word of God is clear. And we think that it's hubris for us to believe that the church gathered for 2,000 years all of a sudden can be replaced with pixels. We just don't believe that. Look at verse 25, not forsaking the meeting as is the habit of some. Um, Here's what I'm trying to figure out. What is missing a gathering versus a habitual neglect? And here's the definition I I, I came up with and I I think hits it. A good definition of habitual neglect, it's when we have decided that the assembly is optional for us. It's a settled mindset, a settled disposition that it's now optional. All right. I mean, like everybody misses for different, we're we're all sick at different seasons, right? I mean, some of us, we we have family vacation, right? We, that we go on. I mean, there's, but, but there's not a settled disposition here, right? Some of you might have these things, but, but um, you're not going to say it doesn't matter, right? I'm going to put this hobby in front of it. I'm going to put this fun activity in front of it, right? And everything's okay. So just, again, think of your applications, man. There are people who watch online who are sick and do not feel any guilt whatsoever, right? I mean, we have shut-ins that we are so thankful. And, like, if the video messes up, they're, like, blowing Travis's phone. They're like, I couldn't hear this. I couldn't see this, right? And so, you know, they're so thankful. And so we don't want you to feel any shame. But, but listen, it's a loss for you. You would rather be here, Right, Bob, who just busted heaven wide open, right? I mean, like when he wasn't here, he was upset. He wanted to be here, right? And he was here up to the very, very, very end. I mean, like, and even like just weeks before, I remember he was standing out there and he was, he was, and, and he was not feeling good. And I still remember him standing up on that thing and his legs shaking because he wanted to stand up and give people bulletins. I'm like, what a baller. So, I mean, like, do we, does, should he feel bad for that? Heck no, but, but, but he longed to be here. He wanted to be a part of what was happening. And this is, this is um, like I said, man, this has not been an easy season for, to be pastors. And I knew this from being a part of Compassion because my job was to meet with pastors constantly, all the time in Virginia, West Virginia. And, uh, and man, they couldn't win, right? I mean, they either weren't, they weren't doing this enough or they weren't doing that enough. Um, but it was, just, it was just, you know, um, the thing that we feel the weightiness of is actually as a pastor, according to God's word, I have to give an account for you. And that's one of the reasons we have membership. We have membership because, because it matters. Like, who, who, who has committed themselves to this flock and who hasn't? Right? I can't pastor Amherst County, right? But, like, we need to know. We're going to give an account for you. So when you disappear, it matters to us, right? It's not, it's not, it's not a cult. We just want to know, are you okay? Like, are you in a, are, are, is your marriage falling apart? Can we help? Are you, are, you know, is there some sin that's just beating the snot out of you and you need, a, you need us to throw you a stinking mate, you know, a, a life raft? I mean, like, what is the situation? It's in that kind of pursuit. It's in that kind of heart. It's a for you kind of thing, right? And so, um, and by the way, um, we have a website here for those of you who are home. We're going to put it on the screen so those at home can see it. If you do have a need, if you are sick, if you are struggling, you know, click on that. Hit that up so that we can know how you're doing and we can pray for you. So, uh, again, in closing, some of us are here today, but I want to ask you, what's your heart? Like, what's, what's actually in your heart? Um, is it an individualism? Right, man, COVID just threw fuel on that, didn't it? We were already individualistic. We were already like autonomous to the nth degree, right? And like, I'm gonna do my thing. I'm gonna plan my schedule. We'll see if church fits or whatever. But like, I mean, wow, talk about consumeristic. And all COVID did that season was just throw fuel on that uh, for the church where we're like, you know, I'll go to church if I want. You kind of like Amazon or Walmart. I'll go there, kind of get what I want. I don't feel like it today. I won't go there. Um, But guys, once again, you can receive content online, but you cannot be the church online. So to recap, Draw near, hold fast, encourage one another towards love and good works. Now, I want to talk to the person right now who just kind of feels like, blah. You're just like, dude, that's, man, if, if that's where you are right now, if you're just like, if you just, if you just feel blah about the whole thing, you might just need discipline. I, I don't mean a spanking, right? I don't mean like a paddling or whatever. Although, Derek gives those out sometimes too in the back if you need one. Um, what you might need is discipline. And, and that might actually give you an appetite for it. Um, you know, I'm sick and I don't want to eat. Well, sometimes you need a cracker and some ginger ale to start feeling better. 
right? I mean, like, like little Felicity, she's so hyper and distracted, she won't eat. And I'm like, she's already skinny as a rail. So I'm like shoving food in that little kid's mouth. And like, I'm filtering the other kids, but her, I'm like, donuts, fat. Do we have fat? Let's give her some fat to chew on, right? I mean, it's just like, you know, you might not feel like you need the gathering, but, it, but it's what you do need, right? And here's the deal. As soon as we put it in the option of, uh, as soon as we put it in the category of optional, we've lost. I mean, I tell people that when it comes to working out. Like, as soon as, like, if you're wanting to exercise, if any of you are dieting or wanting to be disciplined, as soon as that goes into the category of optional, you've lost. And Sunday needs to be like that. Like, it's like, I don't, it's not an option whether or not I'm gonna change my kid's poopy diaper, right? It's not an option. Like, do I feel like doing this? I don't feel like doing this. Like, you know, it's like, no, it's like, I, I, I'm going to do this. Like, there's not even a conversation, right? And that's, that's, that's what the commitment's meant to be like to each other, it's not, a, it's not up for debate. Like, am I going to, hey, honey, we going to church today? Hey, honey, we not? That should never come out of our mouths as a redeemed follower of Christ who's a part of a church. It should never come out of our mouths. Are we going? Are we not? You have weakened yourself. You have hamstrung yourself the moment those words come out of your mouth. It's, it's an essential. Why? Because God said it was. That should be enough. God said it. I believe it. That settles it, right? We've seen that bumper sticker, T-shirt. That's true of this. The Lord said it, and we believe it. And that settles the issue, right? So it's not about how we feel. I'm feeling introverted. You know, I'm not feeling great today. Man, maybe God's gonna, maybe the first thing you need is an embrace from some, somebody here. You need somebody to pray over you. Maybe the word of God or the worship is gonna spark something in your heart, right? And so, and what about our responsibility to others, right? It's not all about me. Like, I don't feel like it. Well, what about the responsibility you have to encourage other people? Maybe that can be your, you know, some Sunday you're like, oh, I don't feel good, I don't feel like this, or da-da-da. Well, how might God use you? How might, God, how might somebody coming today that, that's struggling in their marriage or contemplating suicide or just depressed or feels totally alone and hopeless, and we've all been in different depressed, low seasons, like maybe someone needs, and, and you're not going to be there to do that, right? So let me tell you two things. If this is true, then what? Then we gather in view of the weight that God assigns to the gathering. What that means is we show up on Sundays like it's a big stinking deal, like it's a big deal, right? We prepare our hearts. We, we're, we come early, stay late. Don't get here late. Don't aim for 11, aim for 10.30. If you're like me, aim for 7 a.m. and you'll hit 10.45, Right? <laughs> Like, let's invest to learn people's names. Don't just leave the moment the service is over. Who, who can you ask over for lunch? Who can you build a relationship with? Who might be lonely and isolated? What college student just moved from home and has no friends and they're, they're here, but they don't know anybody and they're insecure and they need the body of Christ to be the body of Christ, right? Come learn, like, be ready to worship when the music begins. Somebody told me the other day, they said, man, it feels like at Oasis, the second song is like the tardy bell in high school. <laughs> Guys, that's not right. That's a sacred time. That's a sacred time. No, we should be ready, and we should be ready. We only do this once a week. We only do this 51 times a year, right? So let's be here. Let's get ready to worship a holy God. And the last thing, and this is very practical, and I've run out of time, so can we just pretend that I'm doing this illustration, or are you guys good with it? I'll do it fast. All right, so these are the big things in your life. No, I'm sorry. These are the big things in your life. I should have practiced this. This is all the craziness, right? This is like soccer practice. This is like, you know, all the, like mowing the grass. This is all the different stuff, all the craziness, whoa, that we have going on in our life. And look, and this is God's growth plan for maximum human flourishing on planet Earth in Jesus Christ, okay? This is gather, groups, this, uh, go. What was the other one? Give. Give and go, all right? So look, so you pour this in here, all right? Told you it wouldn't crack, babe. Um, and... And then look, you're like, so many of us, they, we do this. We throw all this stuff in here, and then we're like, okay, now let's throw a little church in there, and then let's put, um, you know, what we're, how we're going to give to the kingdom and our time, money, and talents, right? And, uh, and, and okay, and now let's try to put, uh, we need to be a witness somewhere in there, and then and it's just, it doesn't fit, right? Versus, you know, let's, let's do this. Um, this is going to fall. Versus. 
we're going to prioritize some things in our life. And this is true of people, I've heard this from people, like how do they, how do, they do that and get everything else done? And, and, and 10 times out of 10, they'll tell you it's because we prioritize some things first, right? We prioritize gathering with the body of Christ. That's a priority in our home, right? We prioritize what we do with our money, right? It's the Lord's, we're stewards. We prioritize, we wanna be a part of what the kingdom of God is doing right? We prioritize sharing Christ and being a witness in our home. Our living room is a launching pad for hospitality, and we share Christ with our co-worker. We prioritize that, right? And we prioritize whatever the other one was. Uh, I can't remember. Um, and then, then you'd be surprised by all the other stuff and how it's still all, wait for it, shimmy, shimmy, how it still all fits, right? It's like prioritize what God has first. What God has first, and that's God's growth plan, and that's what we're going to focus in on. Are y'all thankful for the word of God? Are y'all thankful for the word of God? Um, man, I just, um, let me pray for us, and then we're gonna, what we're going to do this morning is we're actually going to bounce, okay? I'm just going to pray us out. The worship team is going to, wait, do we have a benediction? Okay, what was it? I'll just say it real quick. No, I'm just going to come on up and say it real quick. Um, but I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to pray for us, and... Um, and we're going to close out. This song is going to be like a go ahead and fellowship. You can go ahead and leave. Um, or you could ask somebody out for lunch, right? We can, we can continue to group together well. I'm going to pray. Glenn's going to benedict. Music's going to start. You're free to go. Lord Jesus, would you help us to prioritize what you have prioritized? Would you help us to make a big deal what you have made a big deal? Would you help us to assign weightiness to the things that you have assigned weightiness to. Lord, I pray that you have redefined and blown out some perspectives that we have maybe grown up with, that have been a culture of our own families. I thank you that we can, we can ask your forgiveness of those today and that you, will, you are faithful and just to forgive us of our sins. But Lord, you also said that you want to conform our minds to your word and you want to transform us by the renewing of our minds. And so I pray that some minds today would be transformed. I pray that some habits would be transformed today. I pray that, that people in this congregation, members or not, would be faithful to this church. Lord, be faithful to join a life group and be in community and be prayed over and encouraged, Lord, that we could be what you said you wanted your church to be. So Lord, I pray that you would be bringing conviction, you would be bringing clarity, that husbands and wives would leave from here and would discuss how maybe the Spirit of God pressed on conceptions of what the church is today. Lord, we want to do things your way. We don't want to be a church that just does things the Baptist way or the Methodist way or the way we were brought up. We want to do things according to your word, even if that means scrapping the plan. Lord, we come to you with that type of humility. And Lord, that you would root out from us any kind of traditionalism or any type of religiosity. Lord, that we would just be Christians with the word of God, getting after it to do it the way you have shown us to do it. Give us the courage to walk in this. Help us to not be passive. Help us to not be cowards. Help us to not be lazy. But help us to be hungry to please you. Hungry like a little kid to honor his daddy please his father. We ask for this by the power, by the power of the Holy Spirit of God. We ask for your help in Jesus' name. Amen. Let's stand to our feet together as Elder Glenn sends us out with a good word and then you're free to fellowship and you're free to leave. Amen.